for our belief in them. Well, tonight's the, the great income tax. But that's why I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. And besides the PowerPoint, you've got in your packet uh, some forms. Mm -hmm. And we'll be talking about the forms. So keep them handy. Is it cold, ladies? I'll turn it up. No, it's fine. Oh, I'm okay. All right. All right. I'm going to go on this side so I can see that. So when you work at a job, you're going to pay taxes, and your employer is required by law to withhold taxes from your wages. And there's federal income tax, Social Security tax, Medicare tax, and state income tax. And then in, on top of that, the employer is required to also pay some taxes. And they have to pay Social Security tax, Medicare tax, unemployment insurance tax, state, and both federal and state and then workman's compensation insurance. So the first form we're going to talk about now is your W-4. When you And that's this form that says W-4 on the top. It's just front and back. And um, this is one of the forms, the first forms you'll have to fill out when you get hired for a job. And you have to put your name, social security number, and address on here, and what kind of withholdings you want whether you're married or single, and then how many dependents you want, or allowances, they call them in the W-4. And then you have to sign it and date it. And this, whatever you put on here, determines what your level of income. So this is what one of the first things that an employer will have you complete when you get a job. Okay. That way they know what taxes to withhold. The other form they're going to have you complete is the I-9, and that's the next one in your list. And this is required by the government to prove that you are a citizen and that you have eligibility to work in the United States. So what the first, the top part of it you have to complete with your name, address, social security number, maiden name if you're married, and your date of birth. And then you have to mark if you're a citizen, or a non-citizen, or an alien, which doesn't mean from outer space. <laughs> <laughs> I always think I'm about right. that I'm like, word. That I don't know why they use that. But then you have to sign in and date it. And then the employer, you have to provide the employer with documents, and those are listed on the back. And you just have to show them to them. Sometimes they'll take copies. If you have one of the documents in the first column, column A, then that's all you have to give to them. For instance, if, if you have a passport, then that's all you need to show them. But if you don't have anything in column A, you have to give them something in column B and something in column C. Mm -hmm. For instance, if you don't have a passport, then you could give them your driver's license and your social security card. Uh -oh. Or if you're like me and your social security bar card has disappeared in the move, <laughs> and you haven't gotten a new one, and I need to give them my birth certificate, which I do have. Or you could be like my son when he started his last job and text your mother at quarter to two in the morning and say, I need my social security card by 8 a.m. To, to start this job. And mother's going, that's in the safe deposit box at the bank, which doesn't open till 9 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, boy. But I do have a passport, so I would be able to do that. So that, and then they, they complete the rest of it. They put down what forms they looked at. And like I said, sometimes they'll make copies of your forms and attach it. Because they have to have that. If US immigration comes to their office and wants to see the I-9s, they have to have them. And if they don't have an I-9 on an employee, then that's a penalty for the, the employee. So those are employment forms. The W-4 and the I-9. And let's just go through a sample. Let's say you earn $500 in one week and you completed your W-4 as married and four allowances. So you, the taxes would be held, you have $50 federal withholding, uh, $41.81 state, $31 for FICA, which is the Social Security, Medicare, $725, so your total taxes would be $103. So you'd get what's left. 
So the government keeps the hundred and you get the rest. Hmm. That's if you have four people to claim. Right. Yeah, that was just an example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you have fewer, there's going to be more taxes. Mm -hmm. Then are you the government all yeah. your life? Well, about 25%. Yes, it is. All right, now we're going to look at your 1040 form, which is this. And we're going to skip between some forms here, but right now we're going to look at the 1040. This is like skip the That's, short form. This is the long the form. form. Mm -hmm. But it's the short form is basically the same information. This one just has more information. So the top part of it is your name, address, social security number for both you and your spouse if you're married. And um, there's this little box that says presidential election campaign. And you can um, volunteer to have three dollars go to that fund if you want. So if you if you want three dollars to go to the presidential campaign fund, you can park yes. Otherwise, mark no. And then you put your filing status. If you're single, you mark the single box. If you're married and you're filing a joint return, then you mark that box. You can also file married and separately, filing separate return. Or head of household would be if you're like a single parent with kids. And, um, or it, it could be other dependents that aren't your own children. And a qualifying, quali qualifying widow or widower with a dependent child would be, you know, your spouse has died and you still have dependent children at home. And those are all different classifications. And then the next section is your exemptions. So you get one for yourself, one for your spouse, and then one for each of your dependents. And you have to list your dependents, their names, their social security number, the relationship they are to you, and if they're under 17 and you want to change or claim the child tax credit, you have to mark that box. Then you just add those all up and put that in your box. Now we're going to switch over to the W-2, which is this form. And if you have a job, you'll be getting one of these in January. Because employers have to provide them to you by January 31st. And they can provide it to you in paper form like this. Or, do you not have one of these? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't see it. I don't see it. Maybe I can get it copied. I'm sorry. Anyway, I just look at this or I can pass it around. I'm sorry to get it in there. Um, but on here, it won't have the employer's information, their federal ID number, and their name and address your social security number, name, and address, and then your wages, and the taxes that were withheld for both federal and state, FICA, Medicare, all of that. And then if your employer provides you health insurance, that'll also be on there. Or if you have a retirement account, a retirement plan at work, that will be on there. All that information will be on here. And that's that all goes somewhere on your tax return, okay? Now we're going to jump, let me jump ahead, I'm not going to keep in this. <coughs> now we're going to go back to the 1040, and we're going to go in this section that says income. So the first thing listed is your wages, and that comes right off the W-2. And then taxable interest, if you have a bank account that gives you interest, then you'll get a 1099. INT from your bank, and it'll have the interest that you earned on that. If you have tax exempt interest, most people don't. That would be if you owned a, a municipal bond, and the interest that you get on those is not taxable. You know, like a OP, OPPD bond that they issue when they're doing some kind of um, update, mm -hmm. then. Those, that interest is not taxable, but you still have to put it on there, but you don't have to pay tax on it. And then if you own a stock that pays dividends, then you would have to um, report that, and you'd get a 1099 DIB for that, DIB for dividends. Okay, yeah. on, on that, do you have to pay it if it was inherited dividends? Mm -hmm. And some dividends aren't taxable. They're called qualifying dividends. So you'll put those in, in this, the, uh, the other box, too, the box 9B. 
Okay. But it'll it'll say that on your 1099 DIB if they're regular dividends or qualified dividends. Then if you've got a tax refund from the state, you'll get a 1099 G, G for government, and that has to go on there. It may or may not be taxable, depending on whether you itemized or use the standard deduction. If you're divorced and you get alimony, that has to go on there. Yes, that's income. Not child support, but alimony. So you need to be sure you know which part is child support and which part is alimony. Then if you have a business, your business income or loss will go on there and you have to attach the separate schedule. If you have capital gains or losses, like if you own some stock and you sold it, or you own an antique and you sell it, something like that. Yeah. It's, it's called, it's capital gains, and you have to pay taxes on that. So if I sell an item that I have, and I've had it for a while, and an antique, because it's an antique, it's capital gains? No, or because it's an asset. If okay, you sell, so if I sell my cars. If you sell your car, and you sell it, say you bought it for three thousand and you mm -hmm. sold it for four thousand, then you have a gain of a thousand. Chances are you bought it for four thousand, you sold it for a thousand. So you're going to have a capital loss, and it's a personal one, so you don't have to re you don't report it. No, but if loss. you if you have if you bought <coughs> let's say you bought some land mm -hmm. and you paid thirty thousand dollars for it. And then two years later, you sold it for fifty thousand. Then you've got a twenty thousand dollar gain. That's just an example. But most people that have capital gains or losses is because they have a mutual fund where they own some stock inside the mutual fund, and there's gains and losses in there. And they'll send you a ten ninety nine DIB mm -hmm. or not? That's the dividends. They'll send you a ten ninety nine B. That's the capital gains and losses. They don't do that on inherited items, so. do they? Like, did you inherit some stock? Mm -hmm. Did you sell it? Mm -hmm. Did you sell it as you being the owner, or did the estate sell it? You being the owner. Then you should have gotten a 1090. And let, well, it depends on well, if, as far as the value, it was. Down. Well, then you wouldn't have to worry about it. So because if, if it's. Shouldn't have been able to claim the loss? You should have. They didn't do that. We should <coughs> because it's like when GE went down uh -huh. really big. Because we were, it was really yeah. out there. Yeah. You, know, so you should have gotten a 1099D and then you would have been able to claim the loss. You could claim up to $3,000 a year. If you don't have gains to offset it, you did. You had a lot of them. How long ago was it? After that, that's why I'm asking. If it's less than three years, you could amend your tax return. Absolutely. Okay, then there's other gains and losses that we're not even going to talk about. Now, if you get IRA distributions or distributions from any kind of pension plan, you'll get a 1099R, and that has to go in there. And some of it may be taxable, some of it may not, depending on whether your money went in before tax or after tax. But what your about a, 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 a retirement that the company just supplies? You, that had nothing to do with what you put in or took out? If they put all the money in mm -hmm. and you didn't pay tax on it, mm -hmm. then it's taxable when you take it out. If you put money into it or you pay tax on it, what they put in, then a portion of it will be tax-free and the earnings will be taxable. Unless it's a Roth, which a pension plan It's just not. a pension plan that the yeah. company just gives you for right. years of service. So that, that would probably be taxable. Mm -hmm. Then if you have a rental property, you, you can put the profits and the losses on your tax return. If you're not a real estate agent, a real estate professional, your losses are limited. 
I, the rules are very complicated, so we're not even going to talk about it today. But there are limitations unless you're a real estate professional. Um, if you have farm income, for instance, my, my father-in-law got uh, inherited 80 acres and he rents it out. Um, but he, he used to, now he does cash rent, so we just, if he had to file, we would just do it as a rental. But before he did the, it's, it was the sharing of the profits. Mm -hmm. And so then he had to file the, the that's corn he doesn't well, make enough to have to follow. Okay, but we have a rental property. Is it a home? Mm -hmm. So then you have to figure, you have to <coughs> get a fee. And I do that. Uh -huh. And I put down what you make, mm -hmm. what you pay for, if you pay the lights and gas, and I put down that. Taxes? And the tax, oh, that definitely is the property taxes, the insurance, any work we do on the facility. Yeah. And the depreciation? That's the only thing we've never done on all of our properties. We've never done that. Well, if you haven't taken it before, you've lost it. Unless you go back and amend. They said we can amend it. Yeah, you can go back and can amend you? some of your prior years. How many? I think it's just three, but I'll check that out. Okay, because yeah, I have all 15 properties. We never done it. He said when we sold it, we should. Well, if you sold it, when when you sold them, if you just used what you paid for them as your basis, it's the same as taking the depreciation. We'll talk about it afterwards, okay? Because okay. it, it's, it's complicated. What about depreciation on, on your home? Did you you can't take that. The only way you can take it is if you have a home office and you can take part of the depreciation for the area of your home, but you don't have to. But now they have a simplified home office deduction where you just have a dollar value per square foot. And then you don't have to keep track of all the other things. Which to me is a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Oops. Okay, so you have two different offices in your home. One for one business, one for another one. Are they used exclusively for the business? Mm -hmm. Not for anything else. For the then ministry, you would have one home office for this business and the other home office for the other one. You have to have the square footage of your home and then the square footage of the office. Then uh, if you have get unemployment, you're going to get a 1099G from the state of what your compensation was. And if you have Social Security benefits, you'll get a 1099 SA from the Social Security government or Social Security Administration, and that may or may not be taxable. It has to go on here, but if your income's above a certain amount, 50% of it may be taxable. If it's over a higher amount, then 85% is taxable. But it's never more than 85% that you have to pay tax on your Social Security. And then if you have any other income, and right off the top of my head, I can't think of any other but if you any income you have has to be reported. All right, then we're going to go into oops, I think wrong button. the deductions from income. The first thing is educator expenses. School teachers always buy supplies for their home or their classrooms, and they can deduct up to two hundred fifty dollars, which we all know. They probably spent a lot more than that, at least mm -hmm. my nieces that are teachers do. Yeah, my mom taught me. And then um, I didn't put this on the PowerPoint, but there's certain business expenses of performing <coughs> artists and other people like that that they can put on there. There's a special form that they have to complete. If you put money into a health savings account, that comes off, the amount you put on comes off, or it gets goes on there. What do you mean by a health savings account? That is a um, special account that you put money in, and then as long as you use that money just only for your medical expenses, mm -hmm. then you never have to pay tax on any of that money, even their earnings. But that doesn't include the payment you make for your insurance? No, you can't use it for your insurance. But if you have a copay, 
you can use it for your copay. If you have medicine that you have to pay for, then you can use it for that. <coughs> for your glasses, you can use it for your dentist. When I had back surgery, I had $10,000 that I had to pay out of my pocket. I used my health savings account for a good portion of it. So that goes there, and then if you ha move for work, either your employer requires it or you're moving to a different location to get a different job, then your moving expenses are deductible. The poor, if your employer reimburses you for that moving expenses, you can't put them on, because that would be double dipping. If you have your business and you have self-employment tax, then there's a portion of it that's, that goes on here as a deduction. If you make if you're self-employed and you make contributions to a retirement account, that goes on here. If you're self-employed and you pay for your health insurance, that goes on there. What if you're retired and you pay for your own insurance? If, and you know, you're self-employed. It's still deductible. If you have a penalty on early withdrawal of savings, that goes on here. If you pay alimony, that's a deduction. If you make a contribution to your ARA, student loan interest, at your tuition and fees, and so all those things get added up and those get subtracted from your income to come up with your adjusted gross income. I keep going the wrong direction, I'm sorry. The adjusted gross income number is very important because other things on the tax return are based on that amount. So that's why it's, the more things you can get in here that are subtracted, the better you are. Okay, so now we're going to go to the second page of the 1040, which is the back of your sheet. And the adjusted gross income from the bottom of the first page goes up here to the first of this page. And then you, if you're over 65 or you're blind, you get to mark some box, boxes on here. And your standard deduction gets increased. Which is a nice thing. Yeah. So there's... Here's the standard deductions for 2014. If you're joint, if you're filing as a joint or a qualified widower, then it's 12,400. If you're filing single, 6,200. If you're filing as head of household, it's 9,100. And then if you're elderly or blind and you're married, for each thing you get to add $1,200. So if you're both over 65, then you add 2,400. If you're over 65 and you're blind and you're single, you add 24. Or not single, if you're married. If you're single or you're head of household, then your additional one is 1550 Everybody following me? Now, you can take the standard or you can itemize. And that's, we're going to look at this one, the Schedule A now. And that should be your next form. We'll go back to the 1040 in a little bit. So itemized deductions would be in place of the standard deductions if you have enough of these. The first one is medical and dental expenses. And these are things that you paid out of pocket, not with your insurance paid. So your health insurance, premiums, anything, co-pays. And if you used your HSA to pay those co-pays, then they don't go on here. And you add all those up. But if they're not over 10% of your adjusted gross income, then they're not deductible. So if your adjusted gross income is 30,000, your medical expenses have to be more than 3,000 to be able to deduct. Not very many people can jump that hurdle. The only one that I ever known was my daughter. Because my granddaughter had, has all these allergies and she gets a prescription for rice milk. Mm -hmm. And so all their costs of rice milk is added on to you. Then the next section is taxes you paid. So your income tax that's deducted on your W-2 
for estimated taxes that you make to the state. Now that's just your state taxes, not your federal. Real estate taxes that you pay on your home. Mm -hmm. Your personal property taxes, which is the taxes on your vehicle. Oh. And it's just the tax portion, it's not the plate fee. It's just yeah. the tax. Most of that is the tax. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the tax that's based on the value of the vehicle. Okay. If it's not based on the value of the vehicle, like your, your uh, fee or your plate, mm -hmm. that's not, that doesn't go on here. Mm -hmm. And then if you have any other taxes that you pay, that, they go in there. Then interest that you paid, your home mortgage interest, um, and that will be reported to you on Form 1098. And if you uh, have mortgage insurance premiums, sometimes that's deductible, sometimes it's not. There's an extra form that you kind of have to fill out to. What about homeowner's insurance? That's not deductible. Mm -hmm. not, ins mine. not insurance. It is for your rentals, but not for your primary home. that you pay if you pay um, if you borrow money to invest and you pay interest on that you can it. then the next section is gifts to charities so anything you give to the church or goodwill or salvation army or anything like that if you do it by cash or check that's on one line and if you have more than $250 to any one charity you have to also have a letter from them that telling what your amount of your donation was the total amount and there has to be certain language on that letter or it's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. Okay, what about like a, I, uh, what is it? I think it's a, Danny Thomas, what's the name? St. Jude's. St. Jude's, we do St. Jude's $10 every month. Yeah. So I'd be able to. Mm -hmm. And they, I'm sure they'll send you a letter at the end of the year saying, thank you for your gift, you gave this much, and, and you just keep that with your tax return. If you give items, like if you take a bag of clothes to Goodwill, or a piece of furniture, or some dishes, itemize them out, they'll give you a receipt, they'll probably <coughs> put on the receipt, five bags, two boxes, or something like that. But you have to itemize it out, and it's your responsibility to figure, come up with the value. And most of the charities have something that says, address is this much so you can do it that way or the some people they easy, do it an easy way and they they do a certain value amount per bag and you have to have pictures of it too if it's high if it's high dollar item you do if it's just close if it's something specialized that you're putting a higher price on you do have to have a picture of it but just did they take pictures. did they take that off the picture thing what did they take the picture yeah, they, requirement on? Yeah, they don't, you don't have to have a picture of every single thing. But, if, you know, if you're donating a car, mm -hmm. then you've got to have an appraised to give the value, and you need to have a picture to prove it. Or if you're donating a piece of furniture, you don't have to, you know, and it's, it's like if you're donating a refrigerator that's worth $500, then you, you need a picture of it and documentation that it's worth that much. But if it's just a small item, you don't have to have a picture. I know a, a lot of people think that they do, but they don't have to. Um, so that's your gifts to charity. And then if you have cash or theft losses, that goes on there. Then we get into the miscellaneous itemized deductions. And these would be unreimbursed employee expenses. If you have to have a special uniform and your employer doesn't pay for it, then um, we, you can deduct that. If you pay somebody to prepare your taxes, you can deduct that. Um, if you have a safety deposit box, you have other expenses, you can put it on there. But when you add all those up, then they have to be more than 2% of your adjusted gross income, or you don't get to deduct them. What about uh, your union dues? Those would be in here too. 
but again, they all have to add up to more than 2%. Other then the other miscellaneous deductions is things like gambling losses. So then you add up all those itemized deductions, and if they're greater than your standard deduction, like the 12400 for a married couple that's under 65, if your itemized are greater than that, then you would want to itemize because you get a bigger deduction than you would if you did the standard. So that's why you would, and so you want to keep track of all these things because you don't know at the beginning of the year, maybe you're going to go to the hospital and you're going to have a big bill. Or maybe something's going to happen and you're going to have some expenses that are deductible. So any of those things that are deductible, you want to be sure and keep the documentation, keep the receipts and everything. Okay, like what your business is, what, you know, like we have like a multiple marketing yeah. business now. I'm not even going to talk about the Schedule C tonight because most oh, okay. people don't do that, but we can talk about it. Now. Oh, okay. Cool. Okay? Okay. So, like I said, if the total of your itemized deductions are greater than your standard, you should itemize. If you're married and you and your spouse are filing separate tax returns, some people do that because maybe one spouse doesn't want the other one to know what's what they're doing, or maybe one spouse has something that needs to be kept separate from the other spouse's income for some reason, then they'll file separately. If one spouse itemizes, the other one has to also. One can't itemize and one must use the standard. They both have to itemize. Now, if they're filing one has separately. To file support and is that's when I tell them to file together. Right. Because then they're they they together. could come and take the refund of the, the spouse. Mm -hmm. That's a very good reason why people would want to spouse separately. If your adjusted gross income is greater than 150000 and most people don't have that problem, but if it is, then your itemized de deductions are limited. Let's say somebody didn't pay their taxes. I mean, filed it so much like $5,000 back because of the number of individuals they have, but they haven't paid their child support. Would they automatically take that money? It depends. Do they have, like, is there a court order? Has the state filed something with the IRS that says that they're behind? It depends on what's in the data system. Okay. So if it's all in the data system, then yes, they will take it. And they'll send it to the state, and the state will send it out. Mm -hmm. But you've got to make sure that all that documentation is filed. Well, what I was saying is the one the deduct kids, if they're going to not pay child support, you don't want to deduct them. Yeah. But maybe we should let them deduct them. And then so they get money. <coughs> and then you take money to get yep. the child support. Right. God does some mysterious things. Yeah. Maybe. All right. Now we're going back to the back page of the 1040 again. So we're at, we finished with itemized deductions and or the standard deduction. Now we're going to go to the exemptions. And those came from the front. Remember we talked about yourself and your, your mm -hmm. spouse and all your dependents, that number there, you multiply that times $3,900, and that's your exemption amount. So if you're only one person, you get what? $3,900. If you're a, yeah. Yeah, but if you get over 66. That, that goes in, that increases your standard deduction. Okay. So only three thousand nine hundred dollars you get for one for, for the one. exemption. Okay. That's one for, yeah per person. Okay, so here you now get seven thousand eight hundred. And why do we get? I don't know. <laughs> if your adjusted gross income is greater than one hundred fifty thousand, then your exemption may be limited. Mm -hmm. And I and I know most people, but. The point is that adjusted gross income number is very important. So you want to get as many deductions on the front of the tax return as you can versus someplace else. So your taxable income is your adjusted gross income less the standard, de uh, yeah, the standard deduction or your itemized deductions less your exemptions. That's your taxable income. So all those things get deducted. 
and then your tax is calculated on that. Everybody with me? Plus what you they take out of your check every month, every week. Well, this is what goes on the tax return. It may or may not be the same as what's deducted from your paycheck. Oh, I know that. Yeah. But that's what you're going to owe on your, on your taxes, on your taxable income. Then you have tax credits that get deducted from your tax. So you get it. Wait a minute. I skipped something. Sorry. Yeah, you have tax credits. There's the foreign tax credit. If you pay foreign taxes of any sort, like if you, if you own stock in a mutual fund, chances are they're going to own some business that is foreign. I mean, Nestle's is a foreign company. Wow. Sony is a foreign company. You know, so you're probably going to have some foreign tax in there. So you get credit for that. If you um, have child independent care expenses, a portion of that is deductible. If you have education costs, then you get education credit. And see, the education can go in three different places on the mm -hmm. tax return. So you want to be sure that you're getting the best benefit mm -hmm. if you have education, college education expenses. Retirement site, uh, contributions can go here too. <coughs> It can also go on the front of the tax returns. So you got to make sure that you're putting it where you get the best benefit. Child tax credit. If you have kids under 17 that are still dependents. If you make improvements to your home that are considered energy efficiency, efficiency then you get credits for that. And then there's miscellaneous other credits. Do you yeah. consider the roofs energy efficient? It depends on the road. You have to have documentation from the contractor that shows that it's energy efficient. Like when we replaced our windows in our house, the contractor gave us a documentation that showed that they were energy efficient. And then we were able to deduct the cost of that off our tax, well, a percentage of it off of our taxes. So those total credits, you add those all up, and then you subtract that from your tax. Then there's other taxes. If you have a business, you're going to have self-employment tax. If you have unreported Social Security and Medicare tax, that goes there. If you have additional tax on IRAs, like you took an early distribution, um, if you have a household employee, you have to pay employment taxes on that household employee. An example of this is my former boss's uh, mother had a stroke, and they hired people to come in and take mm -hmm. and care for her. Mm -hmm. So they had household employees mm -hmm. and had to pay the household tax on that. Mm -hmm. And then there's the first time home buyer credit repayment, and I'm not even going to talk about that because that's just a whole different thing. So you add those all up, and that gets added to your tax. So you have your tax, plus your credits, plus these taxes. So that's your total tax. And then we start in on the payments. So you have the withholding that you had withheld from your wages. You may have made estimated tax payments if you have a business. You may have earned income credit if you're um, lower income and you have children, or you're single and you're really low income. Um, you may have an additional child tax credit. And the American Opportunity Credit, that's another college education credit. So those college costs can go three different places on the tax return. And like I said before, you need to watch so it goes in the place that you get the most benefit. And then you have other credits. And those payments and credits get subtracted from the tax you owe for your total tax. And then that is either what you have to pay or what you're getting back as a refund. OK, my daughter, she goes to school now. She goes to Bellevue. Uh-huh. And I, I know she 
to have some of it come out of her pocket. I'm not for sure how much or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So she could get credit for that. And she has to buy her books. She'll get a form from the college telling her what she paid for tuition. Okay. And then it, it may or may not show what scholarships she has. Most of them will show what scholarships mm -hmm. she has. And if her tuition is greater than the scholarships, then and she paid that out of her pocket, then she, All right, she, now that's she a was, deduction for her. She was trying to file what I guess exempt mm -hmm. or something like that. Uh -huh. So they won't take so much out of her. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't let her do it. What you have to do, they don't have an exempt on the W-4. Mm -hmm. What you do is you just claim, claim lots of allowances. She, she but if she, she goes if she goes over like six, the employer is required to prove, get proof from her that she actually has that many allowances. But she could go, you know, like four, and they, they wouldn't take that much out. But it, it's good that she's thinking that way because a lot of people like to have extra taken out because they like getting that refund that because they want to have that save, you know, they want to spend it on something. Mm -hmm. And what you're actually doing by doing that is giving the government an interest-free loan. True. Sure. Hmm. Now, before we talk about signatures, your refund, you can either have them send you a paper check or you can have it direct deposited into your bank account. Yes, Teresa. Okay, so now with the Affordable Care Act. Oh, if, thank you for reminding me about that. If you chose not to take subsidies because you wanted to pile up at the end of the year, where does that fit in all this or have they refund. figured out? So what is that? What is that? The American Care Act, you know, the some people call it the Obamacare where people were buying insurance on the, the marketplace and they could choose to get a subsidy or they, they would be eligible for a subsidy, some of them. And they could choose to take it throughout the year and that would reduce the cost of their insurance. Or they could choose to get it at the end of the year. And if they take it through the year and their income changes mm -hmm. from what they thought it would be, then they may owe, they may have gotten too much subsidy, or they may have gotten not enough. So they may have to owe, which will be deducted from the refund, or they may have to get more back because they didn't get enough, and that will add to the refund. And Teresa's question was, if you choose not to take the subsidy, then that, whether subsidy you should have gotten will be added to your refund. Yeah, is there a place on the form where you have to there figure that be, out? But that's I all coming. I haven't seen the new form, and that's why we're looking at 2013 forms instead of 2014. So, so I mean, what, how does this, how do you apply this? Is every American or just? If you're on Social Security, you don't have to, the Health Care Act doesn't apply okay. to you. Well, I was, okay, yeah, but, but I'm on Social Security. People that are, not on Social Security, and they got health insurance through the marketplace. Mm -hmm. If they're eligible to get it through the B, if they have VA benefits, or they're getting Medicaid, or some kind of welfare benefits, they're not eligible. Mm -hmm. Or if they have insurance provided by their employer, they're not eligible. And if I say so, if they're paying for, for it, it, even he's paying for his. He's unemployed. Mm -hmm. You got it. Now he's employed. Do they provide it, this employer? Uh, they start this month. They're going to do it between January 14th. They, they pay the bill to form mm -hmm. January 14th. They didn't get it until he worked for so many So months. he will, did he use the subsidy? Yes. Did he buy it through the marketplace? Yes. So when you do your tax return, there's a calculation that will have to be made. Whatever he estimated you guys, this income was going to be. Because it, it's the total household income. Mm -hmm. So if if there if it's a family where they've got high school kids that are working, that has to be factored in their their income also. <coughs> okay, now that won't, the insurance doesn't go into effect until January fourteenth. With the employer. Two thousand fourteen. Yes. Yeah. So it doesn't apply, does it? It'll apply for two thousand fourteen if you got the subsidy. 
Well, the thing is, the same insurance company, they know about each other. They that doesn't have anything to do with it. No, okay. Just if he yes. bought it on the health market yeah. exchange uh -huh. and he got a subsidy, mm -hmm. then you're going to have to do that calculation. Okay. But it won't go into effect until 2015. The new insurance? Yes. But this will go on your 2014 tax return. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So you may get an extra, you may get more for refund or you may have to pay in. Depending on what, what your actual household income is versus what you thought it was going to be. It, but this doesn't apply if you buy insurance through the company that you work for? No. Okay. You can't buy insurance on the marketplace if you're eligible to get it for your employer. Right. Well, you can, but you, you won't get, you're not eligible yeah, to right. substitute. Okay, what happens when, let's say we, he's worked for the company that has the individuals that are disabled, mm -hmm. and he's going to work for, say, one more month for that company, but then they want to put a person in our home, then he doesn't work for them anymore. He's not going to get a salary for them anymore? He doesn't get a salary that's deductible, tax or anything. There's no taxes on it. The non-tax. Let's talk know. about that afterwards. <laughs> okay. No, okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <coughs> So, so they haven't gotten any forms or procedures to professionals yet, have they? They sort of have. Okay. But the tax seminars that I was at, everybody was like, we really don't know. We know that we're going to have to do the calculation, and we know that somebody's going to have to give us the information. But we don't know if it's going to come on the W-2, if they have health insurance to the employer. Is it going to come... Are they going to get a letter from the insurance carrier saying, this is how much your insurance cost was, this is how much you paid? Or is it going to come from the health marketplace? And how in the world are you going to find out the household income? Especially if my sister's living me, with me because she lost her job, but she had some income in the first part, and we're paying all of her expenses. And I take my stuff to the CPA, and they don't know my sister's living with me. And she'll but, file her taxes separately, won't she? Will well, she would, but in order to see if I'm eligible for what subsidy, her because she her lives in a household, in house. her income has to be included in that calculation, yeah, both for her and for me. Yeah, but she wasn't living with you at the time, right? It, but she, it, it doesn't matter if she lived with me. Because if, if they move in, like if her sister came to live with her in June, you have to get back into the marketplace and you have to adjust your income mm -hmm. and change it all. And if you didn't do that, then you're going to have you might an effect on your tax return. Mm -hmm. The other issue with it is, though, if you owe taxes, you're not getting a refund, and you owe the subsidy, the IRS has no means to collect that. They didn't give them any way to collect it. Oh. The only way they can collect it is if you get future refunds. Oh. So you're not, you, if you don't pay it, oh. <laughs> then they can't do anything until the next year if you have a refund, then they'll take it. Oh. So that's, that's another perky thing. The last party on the 1040 is the signature. If you and your spouse are filing a joint return, you both have to sign it. If you're filing electronically, you'll have a PIN, and that's your signature. If you pay somebody to prepare it, they have to sign it. They have to put all their information, including their P-10. Mm -hmm. If they don't have a P-10, <coughs> run out the door mm -hmm. with your information with you. Because you have to apply for the IRS to get a P-10. And if they don't have a P-10, then there's a reason why. Mm -hmm. 